Good afternoon, everyone. Please don't be shy. Come sit, come sit. We're all excited to have you here. Um, I want to welcome you to the Sign Institute of Policy and Politics Distinguished Lecturer Series. Our program brings esteemed speakers from all sectors to share their insight, insights and perspectives with our AU community. I'm Amy Dacey, I'm the Executive Director of the Sign Institute, and we so thank you for taking time today to be with us. We are very proud to have Rosario Rosansky, the President and CEO of Booz Allen Hamilton, to serve as our Distinguished Lecturer for 2023. Welcome. I want to thank our co-sponsors for today, the Kogod School of Government, or business, I'm sorry, and the School of Public Affairs at American University. But if you think business and government are separate, David and I have had these conversations, not show. Um, we also have some esteemed guests I want to welcome today. I, I believe Ambassador Stuart Bernstein, a former board member and tra uh, trustee emeritus, is with us today. Um, and Betty Thomas, Chief People uh, Officer at Booz, um, uh, Alan Hamilton, I believe, is with us today. And a Kogod grad. And a Kogod grad, correct, mo most importantly. We tagged that um, a very, um, an eagle. There's several eagles. Um, and we have a number of Kogod alums in the audience who currently work at Booz Allen Hamilton. So welcome today. I want to thank you so much for being with us. Our speaker today is President and Chief Executive Officer of Booz Allen Hamilton Incorporated. Booz Allen partners with clients to drive transformation and advance critical missions through a unique combination of technology, innovation, and consulting expertise. It employs approximately 30,000 people as of September 30th, 2022, and had a revenue of 8.5 billion in the year ending March 31st, 2022. Today, he is driving the execution of Booz Allen's Volt strategy with a focus on velocity, leadership, and technology. Volt positions the firm to become the premier partner to the federal government continuously bringing innovation to national priority missions faster than the pace of change. For more than a decade, he has played a central role in major strategic initiatives, including Booz Allen's 2010 initial um, public offering. He joined in 1992 as a consultant to commercial clients and was elected vice president in 1999 and served as chief personnel officer, chief strategy and talent officer and Chief Operating Officer before becoming President and Chief Executive Officer in 2015. There's also a rumor he started out as intern at Booz Allen Hamilton, and if that's not an inspiration for our students today, I don't know what is. He's done so much outside of Booz Allen as well. He is Chairman of the Board for Children's National Hospital and is a member of the Board of Directors at Marriott International Incorporated, CARE USA, and the Economic Club of Washington, D.C. He is also a member of the Defense Advisory Committee on Diversity and Inclusion, the Business Roundtable, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's Committee on Conscience, and Vice Chair of the Kennedy Center Corporate Fund Board. He was born and raised in Argentina and moved to the United States to attend college. I would also like to mention that Booz is one of the AU's top employers. We have more than 350 alums currently working at Booz, including 50 plus from Kogod School of Business. Now, our moderator today is David Marchuk, who serves as the Dean of Kogod School of Business at American University. And in his role, he leads the school's work to support more than 2,000 students and offer more than two dozen undergraduate and graduate degree and certification programs. It is an honor to have you both here today. David, I leave it to you to run the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here and to those we're live streaming this for alumni, for families, uh, for prospective students, and so welcome to those that are live streaming. Um, let me start with this, Haras, thank you for being here, by the way, and we just had a wonderful roundtable. Thank with you for having me. 50. Let me start, uh, today's September 11th. Um, I was reminded in the meeting that we just had that uh, on September 11th, my wife was like eight months pregnant. And so how many, peop how many of you are seniors in college in this room? Or, so your families, your moms were pregnant on that terrible day. And I remember my wife worked downtown for the federal government and um, our flags are at half mass. So your 
job is inherently tied to national security. So what are your reflections on your mission and your purpose as uh, on this hallowed day? Uh, thanks, Dave. And I, I, I think this is a special day to have this conversation. Um, I, um, I was living in New York at the time, already working with Booz Allen. And uh, I'll, I, I, th I think this is a day that none of us in our generation will ever forget. Uh, we all know where we were, what we were doing, and what we did for the rest of that day. Uh, the, the image that has stayed with me the most has been that for weeks and months after that, if you went into the subway in New York City, um, you would see all of these signs uh, with faces of people who are still missing, uh, which meant that behind each one of those signs, and those have been put up by individuals, they had not been put up by government organizations, which meant that behind each one of those signs at each one of those subway stops, there was a family still hoping, hanging on to hope that their loved one would somehow uh, come back to them. And, um, and on September 11, 2001, uh, Booz Allen had three of our colleagues uh, at the Pentagon uh, briefing a general uh, in a conference room that was on the direct path of the plane that struck the building and, uh, and everybody in that room died. And uh, we have a constant memorial to our three colleagues uh, amongst the so many that were lost uh, in our corporate headquarters. And, uh, and this ties to purpose and, um, you know, we, we are one of the companies, not the only one, I, I like to believe the best one at, at bringing new ideas, transformation, and technology to our government, uh, across all aspects of our government, to hopefully prevent things like that from ever happening. And as I said, upstairs, as we were looking out the window at the flag at half-mast, uh, to ensure that none of, that, that every single one of the young people that uh, we as a nation put in harm's way to protect our freedoms and our way of life can come back home safe. Um, it's, it's interesting to, you know, again, over the course of a career, uh, you, you, your, your own prism changes as, as you look at these things. And, and now with children who's, uh, who are in the age uh, of, of the age of, of um, the young men and women who are out there uh, as we speak, putting their lives at risk to protect their freedom. And uh, I remember when Betty's son uh, was for deployed. Um, it, it, it's, it's a huge responsibility that all of us as citizens have on behalf of this country and that we at Buzal take particularly seriously. Well, thank you for your service. Thanks for everything you do to, to protect our country. I'm going to ask questions for about 35 minutes, then we're going to open it up to the audience and also to folks live streaming. Um, if you have a question live streaming, you can send it in the text, or I guess there's an email, and Amy will get it. So let me just let me start with talking about your upbringing. So you are you're an immigrant, running one of the most important companies for U.S. national security. Um, you actually how did that happen? Uh, <laughs> you actually grew up uh, when Argentina was essentially a military dictatorship. Um, so what do you remember from that time period, and how did that time period, uh, when you lived in a non-democracy, affect your path? So it's, it's, you know, first of all, let me start by saying that I, I had a very happy childhood. Uh, you know, because I'm going to tell you some things about Argentina that sound pretty horrible, and they were. Uh, but at the individual level, you know, loving parents, uh, loving family, um, we, you know, and, and, and frankly, when you're a child and you don't know any better, right? I mean, you grow up how you grow up and you see the things around you and what may not be normal to anybody else in the world is normal to you because this is what you know. And so when I was a kid growing up in Argentina and, you know, in grade school, uh, we learned to march and stand at parade rest and a lot of yes, yes sir, yes ma'ams and, you know, we, we wore uniforms and your hair had to be cut to two, I think it was two fingers about your collar 
If not, uh, I don't have that problem. But uh. <laughs> if not, you were sent home, and uh, and it was very a lot of patriotic songs and, and it, you know it, it, a lot of it was a very regimented uh, regimented way of living. Uh, they, they they had a huge advertising campaign which purportedly was about people not honking their horns on the street so much uh, that that. Um, it was the, the, the slogan was "Silence is healthy," "El silencio es salud," uh, which the undertone of that is just you know keep your mouth shut. Uh, but that's how we grew up, and that's what we knew. Uh, things you learned, and I'm not sure if I learned this from my parents or from my friends in school or how it came about. But there are things you just knew. So you knew. Uh, I, I'm Jewish, you knew that you never told anybody that you were Jewish uh, because people who disappear and 30,000 Argentinians disappear never to be seen again uh, were, you know, uh, being Jewish gave you a higher possibility, higher probability of, of disappearing. Uh, you knew there, if a police officer was walking down the street towards you, you crossed the street and you went down the other side. You knew to bring your ID. Uh, you knew a number of things. And you knew that at any point in time, if you didn't do any of that, uh, you might end up in the trunk of a car, uh, never to be seen again, never, never ever anybody to be held to account. And there's some great movies about Argentina at that, that time period that are terrible but worth seeing. There's a recent movie on Amazon Prime called Argentina 1985 about the trials of, of some of the people that perpetrated this uh, uh, is, is terrible and terrifying. But when you live through that and you're in the middle of it, you don't see it. It's, it's how you live. And so, um, so that's what was, life was like. But the one thing that, that stuck with me and with my then girlfriend, who is now my wife of 32 years, um, is you know, the, the, there's a value system underneath all of that that we did not share. And so if you ask me what propelled us to leave and come here and become immigrants when we didn't strictly have to, we weren't being prosecuted. We, you know, there was food on the table and so many people come to this country without any of those things and without any other options. Uh, was, was that real disconnect between our values and the values of the society we found ourselves in. So you and your then girlfriend um, decide to go to the college in the United States. And most immigrants end up in Washington or New York or LA or big cities. So you ended up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. How did that happen? At the University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire. Well, University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire. So, you know Which that is basically that, a that, rural cow town, right? It's not. It's, okay. a, it's a college town, but but yes, it's in the middle of dairy country, okay. uh, USA. Uh, you, you know that saying uh, is, is better to be lucky than smart. Uh, that applies to me. Uh, in in uh, you know they they could put that on Wikipedia and put my picture right next to it. Um, so I, I think you guys might have a hard time uh, connecting to this image, but I went to the library, and they had books in the library back then, <laughs> and I borrowed the book of all U.S. colleges, and uh, no internet, right? I mean, this, is, this was my source, and each book had one page per college and a rating system. And so we were looking for at least three stars and at most, $2 signs. That was our decision criteria. Uh, so we ended up writing to a whole bunch of schools that met our decision criteria. We ended up in Eau Claire and not the larger schools in the University of Wisconsin system because Eau Claire is alphabetically the first school in the University of Wisconsin system. Okay. You can tell there was a lot of uh, the scientific me method alive and well in this okay. whole, the mind of an 18-year-old. Uh, and uh, then they were very kind. They gave us, uh, first me, and because Cynthia came a year after I did, they gave me a scholarship uh, and, and, and gave us credit for all the undergraduate work we had already done in Argentina, and that sealed the deal. And I have to tell you, uh, probably the best decision 
one of the best decisions I've made in my life other than, than, than meeting and marrying my wife. Uh, and then joining Booz Allen years later. Uh, they, they, uh, th there's something to the American Midwest. You talk about values. Uh, there, there's just a kindness to the people that took us in, that, that helped us learn about this nation, that were patient. Uh, the, the professors were amazing. The amount of time that they took to just take us through things that we had no idea how things worked. Um, they, um, it, it was just incredible. We had a host family. Uh, ultimately, we, we got married in their backyard. Uh, it, it was just a wonderful place to start our American journey. I, I had the, the honor of uh, going back. Cynthia and I both got awards, and I had the chance to give the commencement address last May, and I hadn't been there in a very long time. And uh, it was going back, and then it was a trip down memory lane reminded me how special, how special that was, and really how that values foundation that I learned there has been the foundation for everything. Well, American University is very early in the alphabet, so hopefully. <laughs> so um, probably more dollar signs than <laughs> <laughs> more stars too. To be fair, but I, I mean, this year's incoming class had a 3.8 GPA and a 1370 SAT. Yeah, so I wouldn't have been able to get in. I couldn't get in, so yeah. I'm, you know, they didn't check my grades when I applied for the job. <laughs> um, let me ask you about Booz Allen. So, Booz Allen, is Booz Allen a consulting company? Is it a technology company? Is it a national security? What 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 is what does Booz Allen do? Well, your alumna Hillary Coma is sitting over there. Maybe she can answer this question. You know, I, I think we, by design, uh, define definition, uh, uh, defy definition. Uh, we we certainly grew up as one of the original management consulting firms. Our founder, Ed Booz, uh, in 1914 started this company uh, to do management consult, what was not known as management consulting. He invented management consulting. Uh, there's a couple other people, A.D. Little, and that, that make the same claim. But around the same time, a small group of people invented this industry. And we grew up as a, ma as a premier management consulting company. We did our first assignment for the U.S. government in 1940 when our founder was called in by the Secretary of the Navy, who was a former banker from Chicago, Booz Allen got, got its start in Chicago, uh, to help the Navy get ready for World War II. And we've been serving the Navy ever since, and we've been serving uh, the federal government ever since, to the point that now most of our business is with the federal government. Uh, as you well know, uh, we spun out our uh, commercial business into what became Booz and Company, and then part of PwC in uh, 2008. Um, and and, and Booz Allen is, was a quintessential consulting company uh, for most of its history. Around 2012, we ran an exercise uh, called Vision 2020 to really try and think about where we were going next. And we, we made a couple of decisions that ended up being pivotal to the extraordinary growth that we've experienced in the last decade. The first one is we wanted to get closer to the center of our clients' missions. Uh, if you think about it as a consulting firm, you do a lot of process reengineering, process redesign. We were very comfortable helping the federal government uh, supporting their changes, mostly of their back office type processes, uh, supply chain, those kinds of things. And they're really important. They're, uh, you know, in fact, our first job for the Navy was a supply chain job. We were helping the Navy uh, get ships produced faster to be able to fight in World War II. So, you know, it's, it's important work. But a lot of our work was not at the center of the mission. Uh, there's a difference if you're doing intelligence between supporting the intelligence analysis mission and the payroll system for a right. three-letter agency. Right. Um, now, if you don't have a payroll system, the people that are supposed to do the intelligence mission don't come to work because people like getting paid. So all of these things are connected. But we really transition our, our business much more to the center of the mission around protecting people, protecting troops, uh, creating intelligence analysis, helping drive changes to public health from as close to the mission as we could get. And then the other thing we realized is that those missions were about to change drastically because the big 
uh, wave of change that had gone through the private sector driven by technology was beginning to hit uh, the government with the same level of force only about a decade later, right? So you and I both went through the dot-com. Uh, the government saw the dot-com, but it didn't really affect them. Uh, by the, the early 2010s, it was really clear that, that everything was about to change. You know, cloud was being discussed, a number of things that were gonna be transformative technologies. And we, if we really wanted to affect the center of the mission, we had to get much better out on those technologies. So you look at Booz Allen today, our workforce is about 60% technologists of different varieties. And then the rest is a mix of people who are mission experts, perhaps because they lived those missions before coming to Booz Allen, people like me who are former consultants. Uh, but when you and, say and technologists, so it doesn't mean that they have to be programmers. It means they have to be, like for example, at Kogod we focus on helping business people use data and technology to make better decisions. Right. As opposed to kind of the programmers or the... We would put that skill set, which is externally valuable, in the 40%. On the okay. 60%, we have people who are really the architects. I got it, okay. Coders, um, engineers, people who, are, you know, scientists, people who really understand physicists. I mean, we're doing a lot of work on quantum these days and you know, and there's, there's multiple aspects to quantum from actually being able to leverage that technology and do the programming and building the tech stacks and everything else to figuring out, okay, if encryption changes tomorrow drastically because quantum can blow everything up, how will companies and institutions have to change? Got it. And, and we work, the, the, the reason we defy definition is that we work that whole spectrum and integrate it. Uh, what, what makes us different than the reason we have been so successful so far is that because we understand the mission and we understand the technology, we can really work with our clients so that they build technology that meets the requirements, the real requirements of the mission, as opposed to, yes, we built you the system, you ask for 10 things, the system does all 10 of those things, but a soldier will never use it because you forgot to specify that it could not be 900 pounds. Um, we're, we're in the business of, of working these technologies back from the mission understanding as opposed to here's the technology, good luck with it. Got it. Now the, the focus of today is AI and national security and I mean we're still learning about AI. All of a sudden it exploded but AI has been around for a long time. But at lunch actually you told me a great story about work that Booz Allen did to and your partners to support the federal government with, remember the balloon that came across the United States over Montana? So you all used AI to actually help the government figure out what was going on with that. Maybe you could just tell that story as an example of how AI is helping our national security. So I won't take credit for that. This is a company called Synthetic AI. We're an investor in them, but it's a great story because we can talk about it. A lot of the work that we do, unfortunately, we cannot talk about. Um, so Synthetic is a fascinating company. They, they their original, thesis was around building synthetic data. Why? Because in national security, the big challenge, synthetic data means the computer creates images, for example, that then another model is trained on. Why is that important? Because in, in national security, in a lot of cases, uh, there, there isn't a ready supply of data that you can use to train models on. So, you know, if you're looking at faces and you need to train a model to do face recognition, you can go on the internet and scrape bazillion faces and all of that. If you're looking at a particular model of a Russian tank, uh, there aren't as many pictures of that particular model of a Russian tank in the rain, in the snow, in the desert, against this background, against that background, and all of that. Uh, from, the, from, from above, from this side, from that side, all the, you know, so you, you don't have the million pictures you might need to train a model to recognize that vehicle. So what do you do? You create synthetic data. Uh, you take the, the basic tank and then you use an AI to, get, to create images of that tank against different settings. So kind of think of CGI in the movies uh, to, as an approximation. That's not correct, but I think it'll convey. Um, so, but then what they discovered is that actually the models that we're using 
to create these pictures and the, have value in themselves because they could assimilate and, and recognize these strange objects against almost any background because they were creating it. So what the founder of this small company did when this whole spy balloon story, uh, and this is in the New York Times, so you can find the article. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating story. Uh, the, it, 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 over the course of a weekend, he and his team hand drew what this balloon might look like uh, from an aerial satellite picture and fed it into their mall. And then they used this mall to go back through all of the publicly available data on aerial photographs that they had in the United States and found the balloon and were able to trace it back through time, through its entire trajectory to its point of origin. Think about that. Uh, this is an impossible task for humans to perform. It doesn't matter how many people you throw at this problem. How do you have people looking at the whole country and then potentially an entire ocean over weeks of time in individual photographs? It would be like to find, find, find this a tiny little white circle from the very, very top. It's an impossible task. They got it done in a weekend. Uh, think about the, then think think about a, a law enforcement. You know, there's a say I don't know they, somebody robs I don't know why people rob banks anymore, but say somebody robs a bank, and they're leaving. And you know, just like in the movies, you know, you have all these ATMs that are potentially taking pictures of of the streets that they're on. Uh, Theoretic in the movies, they can always find it and they can follow it and all of that. In real life, uh, it's a lot of pictures. So you know, over a lot of. Uh, or a long amount of time and so forth. And then in the national security setting, it's even more complicated because you have feeds that may come from a satellite, may come from somebody's body cam, may come from a drone, may come from all of these places. To be able to aggregate all of that, think about how you could keep people safe if you had that technology at your fingertips. Think about one of these convoys that traveled for 20 years down those desert roads to be uh, where people got hurt because of IEDs. Uh, there's drones flying overhead over that whole terrain for years and years and years, and there's petabytes and petabytes of, of data feeds. If you could have been able to put an AI on top of that, you might have been able to notice when the ground near the road was excavated and to alert real time whoever was leading that convoy to stop to avoid something and, and all of that, and so many of our children would have come home safe if, if that technology had been available 10, 20 years ago. So, so that's why AI promises um, so much uh, when it comes to, to national security. What about the risks of AI? We had Kent Walker, who was the president of Google here uh, last year, and you know, he, they spent a lot of talk, time talking, he spent a lot of time talking about how they are, AI is so powerful that it creates huge risks. He it gave does. an example of, you know, they have a, um, an application to uh, lip read, which helps people that um, have hearing challenges, but also could help, for example, a nefarious government sure. monitor someone's speech from very far away. So they limit it to certain, a close distance, and they limit the application. You read these scary, stories about, you know, uh, weapon systems being taken over and not being able to control it. How, how, how does Booz Allen, how do your clients in the federal government think about that? So well, l let me start, with the, I'll take you down several paths on this if you don't mind. Uh, down one path, we have had algorithms making decisions uh, for decades, if not hundreds of years. Uh, you know, when you see the movie, in the where you know they're they're going in the forest and there's the little wire and the, when they trip the wire the arrow comes across and shoots somebody that's an algorithm, right? Tension changes, motivates something. Every landmine ever created this side of World War One is an algorithm. AI is algorithms too, uh, and the the big difference, the scary difference, is that those all are static algorithms. The landmine does not learn and evolve. 
these are dynamic algorithms. And so they learn and they evolve. And the, the, the good news in that is that then, you know, to the extent that you believe these tools of war are necessary, you can make them much more precise. Uh, so, you know, it, an AI could tell you the difference between a tank rolling over a field and a child going to look for a soccer ball. Um, that's the, the bad news is they're a lot more powerful and they can drift and they can create tools of destruction we have not thought about yet. And we cannot put that genie back in the bottle. This is here. And it, this is as scary in some ways as nuclear technology and scarier from the perspective that to have a nuclear program, you need to be a large nation and devote a lot of money and a lot of time. This is very little money and very little time by comparison. So that's the scary part. The second scary part, <laughs> uh, now that you launched me down the scary road. I'm gonna actually leave. And, uh, uh, <laughs> is, is that if you think about it, um, we tend to, as a society, focus on the positives without focusing on the negatives of these technologies when we launch them. Uh, if, uh, if you go back, uh, I actually, I, I looked this up on the internet, so it must be true. Uh, so, right, invention of the telephone, 1860s. The first telemarketing call, 1960s. So it took 100 years for the telephone to ruin dinner. Uh, invention of email, 1960s. First uh, wave of spam, 1980s. So it's only 20 years till we learn to use uh, email for, uh, to, to ruin email. Um, it took five years from the invention of Facebook for the first pedophile to be caught on Facebook and tried for trying to use social media for that. These cycles of a technology creating value and then creating a downside are compressing greatly. And so it's incumbent on all of us who play in this technology field to make sure that, that we understand the upside and the downside and how to do this ethically and correctly from day one. We can no longer afford to launch a technology and hope for the best because somebody's gonna figure out how to weaponize that technology on day one, there's a field, an entire field called adversarial AI, uh, which is really about data poisoning and spoofing an AI to make it do something other than what you think it's doing. It turns out it's not that difficult to teach an AI at the training point if you put a, a very calculated series of images in there to misrecognize something. Uh, to assume that a school bus is an enemy tank, to not see a weapon uh, it, when, when one is there, and so on and so forth. And so we need to be very vigilant on, on all of that. Uh, this is, which is why, I mean, we talked first about synthetic and this great startup that we made an investment in. We made an investment in another company called Credo AI. Uh, and what we're working with them on is, is and they're field is, is responsible ethical AI, AI that conforms to the rules and regulations of the jurisdictions in which it is being used. I, again, I'm, I'm an optimist. I really believe that it's, while the bad actors are probably going to use AI more quickly because they don't share our value system, it's ultimately our adherence to our value system, what is going to make us successful and make AI successful in the end. Because the, the fundamental, for any technology, the fundamental reason that people use it and continue to use it is trust. And if we can build a technology that we can trust, then we're gonna be able to deploy it much more deeply, much more broadly, and much more quickly. Let me ask a couple uh, final questions and then we're gonna open it up um, to the audience. So. Perhaps the most important question, how does an American University student get a job at Booz Allen? I'm going to give out Betty. You're going to get a talk to cell phone. <laughs> you should talk to Betty Thompson. <laughs> uh, we're, we're constantly looking for talent. We are, uh, knock on wood, uh, we're growing very, very fast. And we're looking for people who are passionate about the things we're passionate about, uh, purpose, mission, 
taking these amazing technologies and using them on behalf of our country to improve things from the way veterans receive care to the way the IRS protects your tax return to the way uh, the other things we've been talking about from a national security standpoint. Um, so, so that's what we're ultimately looking for the most. Uh, go to our website. We actually are using AI to make sure that we don't miss uh, applications because we have 2,000 open positions at any point in time and you know, we ask you to apply for a specific position, but now we have the technology so that if you apply for a position but we think you're a better fit for something else, we can actually find you in this vast database and pull you out. But the best thing, and, and they've said it, is get to know Betty Thompson. <laughs> uh, everybody knows Betty and uh, she's never met a stranger and, uh, and the, the sky will be the limit. Okay, let me, final question, then we're gonna open it up. How does one, what's your, 90% of American university students have one internship and 60% have at least three during their college years. So what's, what's your strategy for going from intern to CEO? <laughs> <laughs> well, first, number one, stick around. Uh, I think it's, it's a, a war of attrition. It, it really, and at some point <laughs> they had to fire me or promote me, and I guess uh, it might have been cheaper to promote me than to fire me, so they gave me this job. Um, but, uh, you know, I, we talked about it in the, in the round table. Uh, I, I was, people sometimes ask me, when did you know you wanted to be the CEO of Booz Allen? And I, my, my honest reply is when they offered me the job, I knew I wanted it. Uh, this is not a job I, I look for, I campaign for, I try to get. Uh, I, uh, I, early in my career, I was actually very interested in getting promoted because our system worked in such a way that if you didn't get promoted, you had to leave after a certain amount of time. And as somebody who was on a work visa, uh, I could either get promoted or deported. Uh, and so, uh, so promotions really matter. Uh, but then somebody gave me some amazing advice and said, you know, uh, if you stop focusing on promotions, you might actually get promoted faster. Uh, what do you care about? What do you enjoy? And uh, upon some reflection and a couple of glasses of wine, uh, maybe more than a couple, the, what emerged from that is I really love learning. And lo and behold, when I focused on, on learning, um, I actually got promoted faster. But more importantly, I was having more fun at work uh, I felt like, you know, I wasn't just chasing something, I was doing something and finding ways to add value and, and all of that. Uh, and so, so focus on learning, find a place that values who you are and what you believe in and where your values align with theirs. And then, you know, be lucky because I, 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 I've been extraordinarily lucky. I think 70% of the reason I got this job is luck. But um, that's, that's my advice, be lucky. Okay. Um, let's see, we have microphones, and I think, I don't know if we have online questions, but we can go back and forth, so um, let's start with you. Maybe just identify who you are, what year you're in. Certainly, uh, thank you so much for being willing to come speak to all of us. It's truly a, a privilege. Um, I'm a second year graduate student in SIS. I'm also a, f a graduate fellow with the Center for Security, Innovation, New, T New Technology. Cool. And uh, my question is a little bit long. Uh, the DOD and the National Commission on AI and some others uh, have identified that AI innovation is very critical to ensuring US national security. And so my question is, um, does the concentration of AI research and development, significant computing power resources, and valuable data within a select few technology giants like Microsoft, IBM, and Google promote AI innovation through economies of scale or impede it by limiting competition? Thank you so much. Great question. It's a great question. Um, I, I think I see with everything else, it's probably a little bit of both. I mean, the, the good news is that while there are, you know, it, a few companies that have extraordinary resources that are deployed against this. Um, there's a lot of innovation happening in a lot of corners of, of this nation around AI. Uh, in fact, you know, as ChatGPT is an open AI product, and yes, they have a tie-in with Microsoft, but it was not, you know, it did not 
start as a Microsoft product. Uh, I, I believe what we're going to need is, is all of, this is an all hands on deck issue for our nation. This is the next wave of technology. Uh, how would you guys feel if instead of the United States essentially inventing the internet and making it available and, 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 and creating it for nothing, we would be watching as another country did that and we're just trying to jump on that bandwagon as best we can. Uh, we would not be the country we are today. We would not have the economy we have today. We would not have had the last 25 years that we've had and so on and so forth. So we cannot afford as a nation to fall behind in this critical technology or whichever one comes next or whichever one comes after that. Uh, and so I think as many others have, have said, I think we, you know, we need a national strategy on AI, both on how we're going to apply resources, what are some of the major priorities, uh, how to create the opportunities so that everybody that can make a contribution to this field can make it as, as we've been talking about how do we manage both the downside and the significant ethical issues associated with launching something this new in the wild this quickly. Uh, and it's gotta be done at the national level. It's gonna take individuals, small companies, large companies, immigrants, people who were born here, and you know, technology firms, and people who know a lot about business, and everybody in between. This is the, both the challenge and the opportunity of a lifetime. So we have some, uh, speaking of technology, we have many online students at American University in the graduate program. So Amy, you're gonna have a question from a student. I do. Sorry. Um, this question is from John Byrne. It says, are, you, are we ahead or behind our rivals in harnessing AI for rational security needs? And if so, how far ahead or how far behind in your estimation? You know, it's a great question, and I, I'm not an expert, so I listen to the experts on this topic. I think that the, the first question is, how do you measure ahead or behind, right? I mean, ahead or behind on, on exactly what well, this is a relatively nascent field, and so uh, in some areas we are ahead, in some areas we may or may not be ahead. Uh, clearly, large language models in English are far superior to large language models in, in any other language at this point, in no small measure, because as I was saying before, the internet is mostly written in English, and you need massive amounts of data uh, to train them all, and so in, in that sense, we might be ahead in terms of the application for things like autonomy and, and the like. It's very hard to measure. What I do think is, is really important and relevant for all of us to embrace and understand is this is not the kind of technology where anybody can be ahead and plant themselves for long periods of time without constant change and innovation and evolution. And even if we're ahead today, that doesn't mean we're gonna be ahead forever or for long. I mean, if you look at something like the aircraft carrier, right? The United States has had the, the ability to project uh, through nuclear power aircraft carriers for now, whatever it is, 50, 60 years. And no other country has been able to build up to that. Uh, we certainly do not have a 50 year lead on this technology. I don't know that we have a five year lead on this technology. I think the best uh, way to look at it is with a ton of humility and say uh, this concept of great power competition is real. We are a meaningful competitor uh, and we need to stay pedal to the metal uh, to either to either maintain to at least maintain our position. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to to get far uh, beyond where we are. The, the real question is going to be not just the development of the technology but how we choose to launch it and apply it, especially in some of these key national security areas that are so vital, uh, where lives are at risk and where I don't think where any of us is ready to delegate too much to a technology that is still in the nascent stages. And the risk that we have, of course, is some of our adversaries uh, may not have the same qualms. And so we're gonna have to be very, very thoughtful in how we do this, very, very skilled, as a nation, and, and something that is very hard in the current political environment, and very nuanced in the way we have the conversation and deploy these technologies. This is not a simple issue, and the more we try to simplify it, 
uh, the more we risk making mistakes. So between us, and you can, we'll keep this in confidence, do you ever... You're going to turn off the live stream? Or? <laughs> give, do you ever give a speech or uh, have a proposal for your company for business where you use ChatGBT or AI to help you? So internally, we're doing uh, two things, as I uh, described one. We're, we're piloting this tool, uh, again, in the places where that is uh, appropriate to do to, to be able to make sure we're not losing people's talent because they did not apply to the right requisition. Or, you know, you can do a keyword search on a resume, but as you were discussing, at lunch, I mean, if I'm looking for somebody who understands the geopolitics of Eastern Europe and can apply that to national security, uh, you know, if I, as a human, I'm reading a resume, right? I'm looking at people who might speak one of the languages, who might actually have a background in this, maybe got a degree in history or political science, maybe worked in, in, in either in the, admin, in the administration or, or a think tank. So this is not a keyword search, this is a contextual search. And maybe that person applied to one job, and maybe we have four other jobs that are a better fit, and we would never find them. And now we have the ability, uh, using AI and uh, generative AI and large language models, to read those resumes and, and, and find the needles in the haystack much, much better. And then we, we just had a conversation. Uh, we actually believe we can use AI to create first draft of proposals, uh, which for us is we write, I don't know, tens of thousands of proposals every year, and to get to a first draft that much faster, uh, we're still not ready. There's the concept in the military of human in the loop. I'm absolutely interested in having a human in the loop in every single one of these decisions, not just because of the bias issues, but because as, as exciting as this technology is, I think the, the scariest thing is ask it to write your biography. Right. Uh, it is very accurate sounding. Uh, and probably better than what I would write myself, except they got my date of birth wrong, uh, where I went to school wrong, what I studied, and a whole bunch of things. But it sounded awesome. So <laughs> I, the last thing I want is to write a proposal for something we don't know how to do and win the work. <laughs> so, so there's, you know, this is a collaboration, but we're, we're already doing it. Next question in the room. Uh, student back here. Uh, thank you. My name's Luca Consalvi, and I'm a graduate student at American University. Uh, in listening to what you've discussed this afternoon, it sounds like the role of the government is shrinking in regulating AI, or at least being involved as a practitioner of this technology. What would you say is the role of the federal government going into the future? Are we deferring to companies like Booz Allen Hamilton to execute and carry out the uses of this in security or commercial applications? And also, you know, talking to young generations of talent looking to make impact, would you tell someone to go to Booz Allen Hamilton or would you say go to CISA or the FTC if they wanted to be involved in this? It's a great question. Um, so, so let me answer it in a, in a couple of different ways. First of all, uh, we do need to think about how we're going to regulate this technology. And we, didn't, we, not we, we as Americans, not we as Booz Allen, need to think about how we're going to regulate this technology. The federal government, the Congress is holding hearings. There's a lot of thinking that needs to go on because, as I said, these technologies are powerful. Uh, they're out there, and we, they're nascent. And there's things we can do now to make sure that they follow a course of development that aligns with the values of the nation uh, so that we don't have to then try and bring it back if they don't. And so that is the primary role of our government is to make sure that, that these technologies are shepherded through regulation and then legislation the right way. Inside each of the missions of the federal government, uh, there's technology in use already, there has always been, and there will be more. Uh, that this is what, we, what I've seen over the course of my career and it's only accelerating. Uh, there, there's a reality of the last really 25 years if you go back 50, 70 years, most innovation traveled from the public sector to the private sector. Think about space as an example, right? I mean, the space program didn't just give us a landing on the moon. It created a whole new set of technologies that then got commercialized and so forth. The resources for innovation 
uh, were especially long-range R&D existed more in the government than in the private sector. That has changed dramatically. Uh, the resources for long-term R&D now are much more prevalent and much more significant in the private sector than in the public sector. But the public sector still owns the missions and the application of those technologies to the mission. So the argument is for a stronger partnership, which is really evolving and happening between the private and the public sector, where the private sector is bringing these technologies that they've invented and that have great commercial application for the use uh, of the government in the missions as the government sees fit. Um, and, and I think in that partnership, in that collaboration, frankly, the American economy gets to play a huge role in keeping us ahead uh, of, of uh, the, you know, some of these uh, other countries and of this great power competition. Uh, the government alone cannot do it. The private sector alone cannot do it. I really do believe this is an all of nation effort. Um, now, uh, as it relates to an individual picking a career, uh, you know, I'm biased. I would say to everybody, come to Booz Allen. Uh, I, I, I get paid to say that. Uh, but, but in all honesty, um, I think there's a myriad of meaningful careers and experiences that people can gain uh, across this entire spectrum of, uh, of missions. I think if you're passionate about one of these missions, you have to figure out what it is that you're passionate about and where you can have the best opportunity uh, to do that. Uh, I would never say to somebody who's thinking of putting on an, uh, the uniform and go defend our country, no, you should come to Booz Allen uh, because we do national security. No, that's not right. Uh, that's not our job. That's their job. And our job is to support them and hopefully play a small role in providing the technology and, and, and the processes that bring them home safe. Uh, I, I think if, and, and then there are other folks for whom a career at Booz Allen is gonna be more interesting and more rewarding than a career in the government and an alternative for how to affect these missions. And as I said in the small group discussion that we had before, you know, the, there's, there isn't one institution or one company or one place that's good for everybody, but there is one for each person. So you gotta find what speaks to you, what will resonate with you, and, and how you wanna live your career, and, and go do that. And I think you know, sometimes that's gonna be Booz Allen. Unfortunately, sometimes that might even be one of our competitors, although I would argue with that person a lot more. But a lot of times it will be working directly the mission inside the government as opposed to supporting the mission in the way that we do it. If I have a concern, it's really honestly about none of that. If I have a concern, it's about the fact that the tenor of the political discourse in our country is such that it pushes people away from service, away from participating in these things, and to run away from all of these things as fast as they possibly can. And you know, we're seeing it in a number of areas, like the you know the, some of the difficulties that our, our uh, military branches are having, meeting their recruitment numbers and so on and so forth. And so I think part of this is, you know, going back to, to the fact that today is 9-11 uh, for all of the horrific things that happened. Uh, I, I know of a number of people who dropped everything to go participate in one of these national security missions because of what they saw on 9-11. And, and, and for a while, it, we all came together to support them as they did it and to support the nation. And so, like I said, my concern right now is not what part of this broad uh, team you're, you choose to play on, is, but that is, we, we need more people to feel that playing for this team is a good thing. Amy, last question. Thank you. We have one more from online. Um, Sheikh, who is a COGOD student in the MSSM program, his question is, what are the skill set and subjects that as a student I should develop in myself to be able to work at Booz Allen? Great question. Great question. Well, with 32,000 people, we, um, we have somebody that knows something about everything. So uh, the, 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 I don't know that there's a specific skill set that, that, that we're looking for. As we were discussing before, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with the following thought. I, 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 I often talk about the fact that if I think about my dad's entire 
professional life, uh, he had to contend with one significant change that changed completely the way people worked, and it was the, the, the start of the personal, the, when the personal computer showed up. It changed the world for my dad completely. He was able to adapt. So many people didn't in his generation and sort of fell out of the labor force. Um, that was the upside. The downside of that generation is at the tender age of 18, you picked a major and you were going to do that for the rest of your life. So from 18 to 70. And you had to know at 18 what that was. And I don't know about all of you, but at 18, I didn't know who I was, let alone what I wanted to do. So um, I, you know, that, but that was how that went. If you look at my generation, um, we went through maybe four or five, half a dozen significant seismic shifts in what we had to learn to do to stay relevant to, to the workforce uh, and to stay valuable to the economy as, as the world changed so dramatically. I mean, when I joined Booz Allen, uh, they gave me uh, a, a portable computer. <laughs> You weighed 15 pounds. Uh, you had to carry it with both hands. And of course, you, you had to plug it into a 300 baud modem and wait for the whole AOL thing. I'm totally dating myself. Most of you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and all the way to you know spending a couple of days last week with our team learning more about some of these cool things we're doing with AI. Uh, if I think about people that are uh, in your generation, you're going to see one of the seismic shifts in what we do and how we do it every three to five years because the technological change is accelerating at that pace. Uh, we're still not used to AI. We're not nowhere near close to being used to AI. If you feel like you start getting used to AI, start learning quantum because that's coming fast and furious right behind it. Uh, and then, you know, all the advances that we're making in space are going to fundamentally revolutionize communications and a number of other things. And so, I, I, to me, the, the number one skill set that keeps you relevant at Booz Allen or anywhere is the ability to adapt and to learn. And uh, as when I am looking at, at candidates and talking to candidates, that's what I'm mostly looking for and listening to is, will this person be able to adapt and learn as the pace of change accelerates. And if the answer is no, then like many people in my generation or my dad's generation, your skill set will atrophy far, far too quickly. Uh, but if the answer is yes, then as I was telling the group a little while ago, then think about the amazing opportunity. Every three to five years, the game changes dramatically and you get to completely redefine who you are, what you do, how you do it, when you do it and all of that. So, so that's my, my, I don't give a lot of advice because like I said, other than be lucky. Um, but I, I, I do think this is a solid piece of advice, is, is, is look for ways to make yourself more adaptable and more capable of learning because uh, you're gonna be learning for the rest of your life and then you make your own luck. Well, speaking of learning, uh, next week on the 18th of September, we have another great speaker, David Rubenstein, who founded the Carlisle Group. Um, so I'm David's warm up act. Not really. We have two yeah. distinguished speakers. No, he, um, he's great. He's having, he, here's my you first, really should come listen to Here's David. my first question for David. So Dave, uh, I w worked with him. We, we invested in Booz Allen in 2008, maybe around $10. We thought we were pretty smart because we sold in the 30s, so we were pretty proud. Today the stock is? Around 115. Okay, so that's my first question for David next week. <laughs> <laughs> that might be your last question for David <laughs> next week, too. I see. Uh, Ross, let, let me thank Amy Dacey and the Sign thank Institute. You. Liz, uh, Pam with Booz Allen helped. I don't know where Pam is. Thank you very much. Um, Horacio, we are grateful that you shared this time with us. Our country is lucky. Uh, to have a wonderful immigrant becoming an intern and becoming CEO. And American University is lucky that you shared uh, your wisdom with us today. So thank you very much for being here. It's my and pleasure, my honor. Join up. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you everyone and if you have time we have some refreshments if you want to stay maybe meet somebody that that came today and, and share your thoughts for um after the uh event today but thank you all and we do look forward to seeing you next week september 21st um with, with david rubenstein so thank you all Thank you.